bro like the, the amount of dopamine you get from going on stage and getting that reaction is crazy you know and so if you're just subconsciously going through that sh you're chasing that high all the time bro so after the show you know we're always hanging out we're smoking we're laughing whatever and then you go home maybe the next day you feel a little bit depressed bro and then you're like what the fuck am i gonna do oh, let me smoke a joint let me do this let me do that and you get into the cycle and a, a lot of people have this pre like predisposition uh, or whatever to it so it's not just because of that it comes from the aftermath after, after you're done and you're but even if you had a down, banger show you'll still feel like that not as much anymore bro but in the past i would go home the next day bro i would just feel depressed because you you get this high and what goes up must come back down bro. Walla, bro you think we had a come on we're doing it professionally welcome back to the movement we got a very special guest. I'm going to introduce him like that. Who's the guy that introduces you on the on the Yuck Yucks, bro? What's the guy's name? It's always different, motherfucker. Wait, which guy? Cesar Makul. Oh, that guy, Mark Hatfield. That motherfucker. Can I ask you a question? How hard is it to just say Caesar, bro? Like fucking yeah. Adam Caesar salad. Let me say, yeah, exactly. And, and this motherfucker, he, he fucks, uh, God bless him. He's a great, he was hosting this weekend at the show. He was a uh, uh, yeah? Mark Hatfield. This motherfucker just he fucks it up every time if you if you look at the end of the video if you look at the beginning of the video there's a video on instagram what's up? hi i'm caesar hi nice to meet you uh, this guy fucks it up the, after he says it as well as he can in the beginning he has this like proud face he goes like this he goes like huh caesar Marco. Cesar, Marco. Cesar Marco. and then he fucks it up again he, he that's the only time he's ever gotten it right was there oh, but really anyway. That's fucking yeah. hilarious. But the host is different every time, you know? Who's the, Do you deal with the... Who's the owner of that place? The owner By the way, he, you want to smoke? Yeah, fuck it. Why not? Oh. Here. I got Butterfingers right now, bro. I got it. I don't want to fuck this up. Bro. Fuck it up. Who gives a shit? We're here to have a good time, bro. We're, you know what? The Let model... Me. I want everybody to understand. The Lebanese model, bro, is we're not here for a long time. We're here for a good time, not a long time. That's... Yeah, I mean, look. Look at me, motherfucker. I'm, we're two big motherfuckers. We eat whatever we want, whenever we want. That's a damn fact. And and all this cancer shit. I mean, look, maybe we'll live long, but I don't know. Who cares? You know, we're having fun. Thank right, you. We're in it for a good time, not a long time. Exactly. But Welcome to yeah. C Cesar. Cesar Marco. Wallah, fucking how hard is it to just say? Well, I can, bro, you know, I rewinded that video. I'm like, just say, I eat up Caesar, bro. Just say fucking just Caesar. Caesar, bro. yeah. I mean, people like... It's it, to be fair, it's written in French, like the French way. But I mean, yesterday I was an absolute comedy, bro. They wrote on the board Caesar Mal Mal, Mal cool. They just added an L. Voila, they're just, now they're just making their own variations, bro. It's already hard being fucking Arab, bro, with fucking Arab names, and then now they're just adding letters out here. My first one it ain't even that bad, bro. You know? Now you gotta flip it. Yeah, wait, flip it, Habibi. Yeah, flip yeah, yeah. It. But it's, just, where, it's where the where chief is. No, no, turn it around. Oh, okay, okay, okay. There you go. No, flip the lid. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was flipped by itself. I had a little right off the bat, bro. But you know he's a smoker. You have to be a smoker if you're a fucking comedian, bro. You know what, bro? I got into smoking just out of anxiety. Like what? in the summer. But I dealt, <laughs> I dealt with it. So I, I got, like I don't smoke cigarettes anymore, bro. Like seven months. Comedian with anxiety, bro? <laughs> How did that work? What do you mean, bro? We all got problems, man. Fuck. Every comic has problems. I bro. was going to say, you're in front of a whole crowd talking shit. It's a very strange thing, but a lot of them, including myself, like, you know, I, I'm trying to do the, the whole self whatever shit, self improvement, but How's we all bro? have problems, bro. Everybody, you ask them, oh, I didn't have a dad, this, 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 that, that, that. And you know, the Arabs growing up, bro. Parents are hard on us and shit. Fucking hard on us. And I wasn't good at school, so I, I got the extra, you know? <laughs> well, I was like you, man. We're like two peas in a pod, bro. And I was getting straight Fs. Yeah. And I wasn't because I just didn't like it, bro. I, I didn't, didn't like it either, it, bro, man. you know? I cheated my way through fucking all of it, man. And bro, uh, I, you know what? I won't say her name, bro, but I had... Um, I used to always stand up uh, against the bullies. I used to I used to fuck up the bullies all day, right? Yeah. And there was this girl. She was an Asian girl. Wallah, the best. Anyways, one day I pull up to the locker bay. Fast forward a story long short. The girls ran away. Yeah. And then sure enough, this girl, right? 
she's the most happiest nerd in the world, bro. You know? And I'm like, yo, let me rock with her real quick. So I start chopping it up, and it turns yeah. out she likes anime. Okay. And then Dragon she was Ball? my homie, right? At, yeah, exactly, bro, yeah. right? And then she starts talking about Sailor fucking Moon. I hate Sailor Moon, bro, right. you know? Fuck Sailor Moon. And then, bro, I graduated math. I graduated oh, English, bro. Oh, shit, you had a plug, bro. <laughs> no. Well, she was, my she was my homie, though. Yeah, yeah. So chop it up with her. Well, that's little perks. No. That, that, was my, that was my version of Friends with Benefits, bro. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I, I mean, I just got whatever I could, man. I, motherfuckers in my school were greedy, bro. They were the type of people they do. They, once you... They let you cheat for like half the test, and then they're like, "Yo, I need to." <laughs> yeah, you gotta. Get so I just took bio. matters into my own hands, bro. I would make these little like cheat sheets. I would just slide it under the test. Bro, they were getting creative with it at some point. They started making those fake calculators. That was bullshit. You you, you needed to do like, you know, you, you do something that nobody's doing, and sometimes the obvious. Is not obvious? You know what I mean? It's like the whole thing of hiding in plain sight. That's a fact. So well, I, you, you tried, bro. You tried to do what you got to do. How's the whole self help working for you now? It's great, bro. I, you know, once you understand, and I'm not, I'm not a fucking genius, but once you understand how the brain works and you know how life works and all this shit, it's very easy to manage now. You understand like uh, dopamine and all this. Shit, I'm not gonna get into it because I'm not an expert. Who gives a fuck? Get into it. You're a comedian, anyways. Bro. Well, you know, you, you it, it's like there's different reward systems in the brain, and you do these, like, for comedians, bro. There's a lot of self sabotage in terms of like drugs or addiction and all these things, right? And for us, like you're out every night, and bro, like the the amount of dopamine you get from going on stage and getting that reaction is crazy you know and so if you're just subconsciously going through that shit you're chasing that high all the time bro so after the show you know we're always hanging out we're smoking we're laughing whatever and then you go home maybe the next day you feel a little bit depressed bro and then you're like what the fuck am i gonna do oh, let me smoke a joint let me do this let me do that and you get into the cycle and a, a lot of people have this pre like predisposition uh, or whatever to it so it's not just because of that. So you'd say you were predisposed to anxiety? They're the fucking, anxiety comes from the legend. aftermath, bro. Huh? It comes from the aftermath. After you're done and you're But even if you had down, a banger show, you'll still feel like that? Not as much anymore, bro. But in the past, I would go home. The next day, bro, I would just feel depressed because you, you get this high... And what goes up must come back and down. The fuck comes out hard, huh? Yeah. It's like when you do, like a good example is, this is an extreme example, but if you do uh, MDMA, right? They say like everything, your serotonin, everything spikes to the max for that day. But then the next day you get this hangover where you feel really depressed because it's like your, your body used all your, your like, the, the, the thing about dopamine is it, it's, it replenishes, but it's also, it's, it spikes. It goes up and down. The, the, the way to, like, control it is to keep it at an even keel. Like, you have to keep it in this little box. You can't let it get too high. You can't let it get too low, you know? I found what was nuts about MDMA is I just found out caninis and coke are very similar, but caninis makes you feel even better, bro. Okay. So yeah, I've never gone it. that far. I've never done either. Dude. I'm a square, bro. Yeah, okay. I'm a square, huh? Huh, that's all I do, bro. I, These are beautiful, bro. Halal, bro. You know what I mean? It's yeah, a yeah. very expensive halal hobby. Yeah, yeah. But um, I was talking to somebody. No more names for that guy. <laughs> you know? Of course. Uh, and I was asking him, bro, since he's done both. I said, what's the difference? Because what? Anyways, yeah. So I asked him, what's the difference? And he's like, bro, I've done both. But you feel like a king you feel like a king on coke but mdma is completely different bro you yeah. feel like an emperor man you feel fucking incredible it's very i've done that and, and it's very nice you feel happy you feel like nothing can go wrong you love everybody and there are benefits to it i know it's been therapeutic i've heard let's say you have beef with somebody bro you take mdma with them and the thing about us is there's a lot of ego involved when it comes to, let's say, like, hashing it out with somebody. And you're fucking lab. Yeah. But we I all know we're one of the most egotistical people. Yeah, in the world. I, I fight those instincts daily, bro. And it's like, 
these things and philosophy and all that, it's, it, you can't just read a book and do it. Like, you have to live this every day, bro. You have to remind yourself, yo, I'm angry right now because of this, this, this. These are stupid reasons, you know? Your, st your body is still going to get angry because you're a human being. The fact. But you have to remind yourself, yo, I'm angry for the wrong reasons right now. Let me just talk to this fucking guy. But if you take MDMA, you don't even have to deal with that. You just talk. You're like, listen, man, I'm sorry about this. Blah, blah, blah. You're very open because there's really? no ego anymore. It's just love. Really? I thought it would have been the opposite. That you have too much going on in your system and you, you feel like you're on king shit anyways. I thought it would amplify the feeling of egos, you know? It depends on maybe on your personality. Have you ever fought a guy on coke, bro? Coke is different than MDMA. Bro. I've never fought a guy on MDMA. Have you ever fought a guy on coke, bro? No, the guy was the crazy. guy was like a fucking the guy was like an energizer bunny, bro. He wouldn't stay down. I'm like, holy smokes. Coke is different. I, I think I, again, I've never done coke, but I think the goal of cocaine is to keep you going, right? So let's say you you have a few drinks, you start to slow down a little bit. I kept them fucking going already. Right, that shit believe keeps it. you going, so you could drink more and you could party more, right? And then obviously it gives you a nice high, gives you a good feeling. I assume that's why motherfuckers do it. But go go shit, go take a parachute or two, come see Caesar Mac at your local yuck yucks. You know what I mean? Get a it's quick a chuckle get, out of it. It's a good way to get you know. <laughs> Bro, tell me what did your dad say the first time you're like, fuck you, I'm gonna go do comedy. Bro, with with my like the number one into becoming, I guess I don't say becoming a man, but you know what I mean? Becoming your own person is to shake that, is to shake your parents and I, and I know some of you had supportive parents good for you all right but <laughs> that's a fun, well good for you for, for sure me, for me it's like bro the one time i would work and i would get like an a minus it would be like yo why don't you get an a plus well there was never it was never good enough right and so I, at a certain point i was like you gotta stop giving a fuck with these people they're your parents they love you everything they do is because they love you you don't hate them but you also have to be like, I'm my own person, bro. I have to make my own decisions. And so when I dropped out of uh, uh, college, there was a few years where I was doing bullshit. I was repairing phones and whatever. I got, I got into government eventually. But I was always looking for something to do. I, I wanted to be a DJ at one point. I wanted to be a rapper, you know, all this bullshit. You wanted to be a rapper? Yeah, you know, I, I love hip hop, but I'm, sure. not, I'm not that guy. Mm. But then one day I'm like, let me try comedy. My my friend was having a wedding. He wanted me to give a speech at his wedding. I never ended up giving the speech because of they made a mistake. But I was like, let me go on stage and just get used to the mic. And from there, bro, it was like, loved it. Yeah, yeah, it was, you know. And and they're always like, why don't you get a real estate license? Why don't you do this? I'm like, I got this job. It's not the best job. It's not a bad. It's, you know, slightly above average. I could live off this for the rest of my life if I just live, you know. And I'm not, I don't like buying shit. I'm not big, you know. I'll get into shit, like you said, cigars, bro. I got into cigars for a while. I get into different hobbies, but. So you don't really give a fuck to be flashy and whatever. You look like you're just a stand-up just a stand -up guy just chilling. Uh, yeah, I, I don't care about that you stuff. You know, you look like Lobo Domus, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, uh, you know, I... I as this I, job you're talking about is at the comedy uh is it called the comedy central or is it just called the yuck yucks so it's yuck yucks so i do work there once in a while like uh seating and you know working the door and stuff um and then obviously i i perform there but comedy is a very long road bro and and i don't know if i mean you could compare it maybe to being a <laughs> i'm not going to compare it to being a doctor but it's it's similar to where you know, you got to do four years of university, then you got to go to medical school, then you got to do ten this. years. Yeah. Then. So this is like a ten year thing, bro. Like right now, I'm only at five years, so I'm getting paid, you know, pennies to do this shit. Compared to the the Russell Peters and all that, or are you compared to like other comedians in the startup level in your five years? <sighs> there's so much variety, and there's so much room for failure because it's not even a a straight path. It's like the, the, the one constant is that you have to put in the time, right? You have to go to open mics every day. You have to do as many shows as possible. You have to write jokes. You have to work on the performances. And there's so many different aspects to it 
but it's like they say the rule is like to become a headliner, which is the guy he saw the other night, Todd Ness, the, the last guy on the show does like 40 minutes, 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. That's at least 10 years usually. Now there's exceptions to the rule. There's people that skip steps, but... Is that, is that, is that like Hollywood kind of thing or... For what? Am I, is this like a Cat Williams part two or doing Club Shay Shay? No, no, this is, uh, is this there, is no. like, You gotta go kiss the ring and then, you know, you gotta put, in, you know, you gotta poke the bear. Well, I mean, like anything in life, you know, like the whole 48 laws of power thing, it's like, there is a little bit of that. Uh, and there are easier paths to take where if you focus more on the networking than the actual comedy. Oh, okay, you're playing politics now. You could do that. Um, but I'm just not. I, I don't fault people for doing that. That's just not in me. My thing is, like, go up and be funny, as funny as possible. Be nice to people. But I'll never, like, kiss ass or, or, or try to get on a show that I don't deserve. If someone asks me, bro, I'll say yes and do my best. But, you know. You want to go through the motions, you're saying. I, I just want. I don't even want to be famous, bro. I just want to be great, you know. And, and whatever comes with that, comes with it. If I can make. The same amount in doing comedy that I'm making at my job right now, which is like, like an average salary, bro. And I can live my life doing that and make people laugh and be righteous, then I'll be happy. I'm not chasing it. But whatever comes with it, comes with it. I'm not against making more money and you still got to try. <laughs> you got to be able to try to make a little bit more. You have for to sure. try, bro. You have to talk to people. You have to go out of your way, but... You know what? I think the good thing about the whole making more money part, especially like in comedy or media or entertainment, is the fact that the better you get, the more you're compensated. So you, you know yeah. when you're getting paid the big bucks, you're like, yo, I'm on the big leagues. Mm -hmm. Like a Dave Chappelle or something like that. But let me ask yeah. you this. And when you're doing comedy, because I remember I seen one of your skits where you're talking shit away into Mr. Santa Claus, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah Papa sure. Noel here, Lebodamus. Yeah. And uh, you have a bunch of, you know, little minions and, you know, whatever. Yeah. When do you... when? When is there a line that you're like, okay, I'm crossing in a joke? I personally believe a comic, I should do whatever you want. But like yeah. David Ch Dave Chappelle, remember he started making the trans jokes? Yeah. And then fucking, <laughs> they came after him, but you can't cancel Dave Chappelle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When is there a line that you're like, okay, I'm not going to overcross this line? Uh, honestly, like, it's still a, a journey and I'm still too young in comedy maybe to be canceled, you know? Um, but it's very rare... I mean, look, like you said, I, I do talk shit a lot on stage, but I talk shit about myself too. And I always try to balance it out and make it fun and not be too mean, you know? But Like the girl that gives you a stupid rating with the fries kind of thing, you know? Yeah, 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 exactly. 4.67258, you know, like, yeah. fuck you. Why you got to get so many decimal points? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> what are you, fucking Dave Portnoy? Yeah, I mean, yeah, she's, yeah, she's being very specific. And, um, you know, it's it's a lot of that is improv and um it's what comes to mind and I, I feel like in my head like these some of these maybe i don't have the skill to explain it yet but in my head there's like a scale and i know that i know when i'm going too hard on somebody want to pull back or when i'm going too hard on an audience and sometimes it, it doesn't work bro like obviously we're gonna post the stuff that works you you know you either post the stuff that works or the stuff that goes like horribly wrong. <laughs> well, give me an example of horribly wrong. We already know that for sure. Why would you always post that one? You know what I mean? Yeah. But what? Well, give me a situation where you're like, yo, I went way too far, bro. Honestly, it's never been the case of going too far for me. My my comedy partner George George Asili, he's much more. Like, he goes even harder than me. And for him, it's like, he's had moments where motherfuckers just get completely mad at him or uncomfortable or whatever. Um, is this when you pick a guy to just go at, or is it when you're, when you're doing crowd control? It's a little bit of both, because sometimes you, you say something that the crowd doesn't like. And sometimes, bro, like, we're fucked up. The instinct is to just go harder. You know, <laughs> so um, just keep pressing the gas. Yeah, it's, it, like there is. The That's a beautiful of, instinct. There is a side of comedy where you want to recover, you know, 
and you want to, uh, you know, you're doing bad and, and you do something to, to make it good. But there's a, a great comic, uh, Patrice O'Neill. I love Patrice. Yeah. Well, one of the, my, my favorite, the greatest to me. He said a thing where it's like, if you come off stage and you feel good about yourself, like you didn't do a song and dance to win them back, you were just you and you won them back, or you didn't win them back, but you were yourself. And like, that's all that matters, you know? So coming um, out yourself. Exactly. I always try to resolve everything within myself. I'll never like, again, going back to kissing ass or being like, whatever. I, I won't go to those lengths to recover if I'm... Like, give me an example where you fucking, you butchered a crowd and you're like, you know what? <sighs> I mean, I've, I've bombed a bunch of times. I think the times where I've bombed personally, and when we say bombed, this is business uh, industry talk for... Oh, uh, my God. Yeah, let's getting say no bomb. Loss. Yeah. Shut the door, Shawnee boy. They're going to kick it in. That's the thing. Fuck I mean, two lebs talking about bombs uh, here. Talking about bombs. We're going to get kicked off YouTube oh for that. Oh, my no, God. Cancelled. For me, it's a loss of confidence. It was never... It's never been like the audience hates me. Sometimes they hate me and I'll recover it. But it's been a loss of confidence where I lost confidence in myself. And that's what I'm learning now is like, you can say something... You know, I'll, I'll say something like, uh, like there's a line I say, I'm, I'm supposed to hate Jewish people. I don't, you know, I, but when I say I'm supposed to hate Jewish people, people freeze up. And it's up to me to not freeze up too. If I freeze up too, then I lost them. Oh, they're fucked. But if I have confidence in what I'm about to say next and just keep my, because this is like what I believe. I'm not just saying things to be edgy. Right? Yeah. So if I keep the confidence and I believe and I recover it, then you can recover. But if you like say that and you notice them get uncomfortable and then you get uncomfortable, they feel you getting uncomfortable, it's over. You're finished. The whole show is done. Maybe not the whole show, but you're set. And and I'm doing like the most I do is 20 minutes now. So I'm not in the territory of there's people that you could do well for if you're doing 45 and you're doing well for 20 and then you bomb start bombing at 20 minutes bro that's a whole other skill that i haven't even learned yet <laughs> okay or how to recover from that yeah you know? after you're already killing it you're saying yeah or you're doing well you're getting laughs and then you you shift gears and then you are stuck and you have to recover it's it's difficult but for me it's, i found like how did you finish that joke when you're like i'm supposed to hate the jewish people before you start bombing here you know well i don't people wanna, are gonna start making that into a clip i'm supposed to hate jewish people bro you well, know there's the meme. Oh, yeah, true. Well, listen, there's I, the meme right there bro you know typical <laughs> level, level damas I, I i talk about our i don't want to get too much into it because it's still a joke i'm working on but i talk about our similarities you know because they are similar to arabs we're very similar and i'll talk about how they made the we made the, it's either tabbouleh or hummus. I've been saying hummus. But we made Lebanon, this is ridiculous. Lebanon made the world's biggest hummus. It got into the Guinness books. <laughs> and don't quote me, it might be a different dish. But then Israel came and they broke the record. But then Lebanon came back and broke the record again. And I'll talk about accountants, how we, bo we both do accounting. Maybe you go to a Jewish guy, he does it all by the book. You get a nice return. You go to a Lebanese guy, he, you get even a bigger return. But you might go to jail, you know? There's like that whole thing. Yeah, so he, he cooked the fuck out of those books. Yeah, yeah. So it's very similar but different. And it's like Jewish people work together. Lebanese people don't like working together at all most of the time. You know, there's that documentary about the Lebanese burger mafia. where Lebanese burger mafia. Yeah, it's very interesting. It's this like burger chain that opened. A bunch of Lebanese people took it over. And a lot of them were family. And at one point they're like, listen, we can franchise this shit. But we have to do it under one like uniform thing, like McDonald's. Yeah. And what they were like, no, I want to do it my way. I want to do it my. And it's like, eventually the business failed. It was like if they really franchised it and made it a consistent thing, they might have found success. I don't blame them, man. You know what? I won't even lie, bro. In business, I fucking hate doing business with Arabs. Yeah, it's true, but like, why, bro? If everybody was just like, all right, let's just relax and figure this shit out. I they think make they it could. fair for both sides, man. It's okay if you, you know what? It's weird. It's it's like it's it's blasphemy to have the word profit yeah. in your numbers. 
Yeah. But at the same time, they can fucking crook you out of every dime. It's like, bro, mm-hmm. it's okay if I make a buck doing the job for you. You know, it's okay. You know? Man. It's, yeah, I mean. But I think it's a culture from back home because all they do is haggle all day. Mm, yeah. But I think that's what it is. Yeah, and, and they all have their own vision and everybody thinks they're right. Like, as much as I talk shit about some other races, I'll talk shit about Lebanese people the most because <laughs> I know them. Bro. And I know all the ins and outs and stuff. But it's still, again, this is all... I'm a completely different comic now than I was a year ago. Right now is the stage where you evolve a lot. So what I'm saying now, I might not even agree with in a year, you know? It was just for today's time. It's just what I believe now. But I'm still growing as a comic. I'm growing as a person. And it's like the whole fucking, I don't know who said Muhammad. I don't know who the fuck said it. One of these quotes you see on Instagram, it's like if you... If you're 50 and you're the same as you were when you were 20, you didn't live your fucking life, you know? There's growth involved in this shit, you know? So have you ever... Well, how'd you, how'd you deal with your first heckler, bro? First set? There's a heckler, heckler. Oh, first heckler? You have to tell me how to heckler, bro. I think the first, like, serious one that I got, I was doing an open mic, and there was a, there was a black dude in the front row. And, and for me, it wasn't even about race. I just thought I recognized the guy. I'm like, are you from Jasmine? Like, what, this is where I grew up. Ja- Jasmine, Jasmine Crescent. Like, are you from Jasmine, bro? I, I recognize you. And he's like, what, are you saying that because I'm black? And I'm like, oh, I froze up. But then I was just like, no, bro, I, you look like somebody. I, I for, This was years ago. But I didn't let that intimidate me because that wasn't my intention. My intention was really that I thought I knew the guy. And so I went through the motions of just explaining myself. And I recovered it like that. And from that, I learned the thing of stay confident. If you're telling the truth, first of all, and this is another Patrice quote, if you're telling the truth, then you don't even have to remember a joke, bro, because it just is what it is. You're just being funny with a story. And then it's like you can't let people change what your actual opinion is because you're just talking. I'm talking. You're going to take my words and... Turn it racial, bro. I'm not going to let you because that's not what my intention is. I'm not yeah. going to be afraid of that. So it's just, it's it's all about. I want to ask him, why do you even know about Jasmine Crescent? <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I mean, look, out of no, because when I drove here, I, I st- you know, you drive past the south and you're like, that's the belly of the beast for Arabs. That's, that's where all the shisha spots are. And fucking during Ramadan, bro, you're driving at midnight. Through the south, you just see a bunch of people in dish dashes yeah. outside of a pizza store. Thirty pizza days shop, were holy. The other, the other three hundred and thirty-five days, I'm the maniac all day. You could do whatever you want, but you can, yeah. But no, uh, it, so that was your yeah. first heckler. That was my first one where I was like, "Were you nerve I have racked? to deal with it. I, I, of course, of course, but you can't. As with life, bro, you can't show weakness. You're gonna feel these emotions it's not like it's not about hiding it's not about suppressing your emotion bro because unless you're a sociopath bro you're gonna feel something that's a quote and then we're gonna put your name caesar mac <laughs> it's true though like you're gonna feel anger you're gonna feel sadness happiness whatever it's up to you to control it bro and don't let them sh- see that weakness and then after the show go home and fucking cry or whatever but during the show bro have you ever had that I don't Has know anxiety I, ever racked you to the point where after you left, you're like, yo, bro, I just broke down in tears? I've, I've never been on stage. I want to know, yeah. you know. I mean, in the beginning, bro, there's you have to learn how to bomb, you know? I feel like in the beginning, you bomb and you feel like your life is over. You're like, what the fuck am I doing this shit? There's, I just did eight minutes in front of three people to silence. The comics, The comic that comes up after you on stage is making fun of you. You're like, what the fuck? What do I, even, yeah, I got tears in my eyes. I never <laughs> sat down and cried. Maybe during COVID, I had a couple of cries because I thought it was over. I'm like, there was no comedy anymore during COVID. You yeah, know? yeah. But I've never cried after a set. But I did have had like the, you know, the Arthur, like the fucking, fuck, what the fuck? Am I, fuck that guy. If I ever see that guy again. <laughs> you turn it to Peaky Blinders? You, you turn it to fucking George Costanza, bro, where he's oh in the car God. and he's like... Thinking of comebacks to, you know, say to the guy after the fact. Bro, that's savage, bro. Matt. You bomb for eight minutes and then the comic after comes and tries to fucking... We must say hell out, bro. Mops the floor with you. And he gets laughs. Yeah, he get, he gets laughs. That's the, cause, listen, 
bombing is bombing and there's no I, I always like to blame myself. I always like to think there's a path to making somebody laugh. Yeah, yeah. But if everybody bombs on a show, you feel a little bit better, you know? But if you're <laughs> like the only one or one of the only ones that bombs on a show, everybody else gets laughs, you're like, that well, one hurts a lot well, more. Well, that's when Patrice O'Neill will come out and be like, misery loves company, huh? Well, that's, again, now that's learning how to bomb. It's like, he, the, another thing he says, like the... Sometimes you just got to pull out. And we're talking a lot about artillery here. Relax. This is a metaphor. Yeah, like you just got to pull out two hand grenades, bro, and just uh, toss them into the crowd. Fuck. Man. Yeah. Shut the doors, boy. Shut the doors, <laughs> man. We're fucked. I've never held a grenade, all right? I've never even seen one. And maybe in Call of Duty. That's it, bro. But. Buddy, we were just saying the other day, imagine they released our Call of Duty chats. We're all getting fucking jailed. That's, that's a whole, like, meme, but it's true, bro. Especially with Arabs, like... I, I like to talk about how racist Arabs are. Oof. You know? We're even racist to each other. We're racist to each other. But that's the beauty. It's because, I mean, for me, and I know a lot of us, even I grew up in the East End, but in the South, you know, you grew up around Somalis and Afghanis and all these, like, different types of immigrants. And we're just fucking with each other. We're, you know, we're making fun of the Somalis for being Somali. They're making fun of us for being Arab. Like, Box. we're talking about them putting bananas in their spaghetti and shit, whatever the fuck it is. And so to us, it's not a big deal. Like, you know, sometimes it gets out of hand and you get into a fight or whatever. Fine, fair enough. But the next day you're back on the basketball court. Like That's nothing a damn happened. fact. But by the way, Walla, what you just said is actually the truth. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was a kid, I went to my boy's house and then he told me, yo, put mousse in your spaghetti. And I'm like, what? Why yeah. the fuck would I put cream in my spaghetti, bro? You yeah. know? Yeah, yeah. And he's bring busts out the banana. I looked at him, what the fuck am I going to do with this? Who mixes this shit with and this And it's brain? not even like... You know, Jamaican food, whatever Caribbean food, fried plantains, like that's delicious. They just cut cut up a whole oh, banana. fucking banana, <laughs> all mushy and shit, and just throw it in the spaghetti. I did a rock with it, but it was an interesting thing, you know. Everybody has their thing. I mean, we we probably do some shit that people are like, "What the fuck?" You know, we're eating fries with with pita bread. Like, who the fuck does that? Well, that's a fucking fuck, bro. I hate it so. macaroni, bro. The Arabic version, bro. <laughs> please stop fucking remixing this shit, man. Keep it Italian, bro. They knew what they were doing, man. I love my mom, bro, but when she starts making, like, white people food or, like, Italian food, Chinese food, whatever, it's just one of the worst things you've ever had in your life. There's a certain nostalgia to it, but it's just, like, they're cutting up the spaghetti with a, with a fucking knife, and the spaghetti is so... Like, I didn't know what al dente was until I lived by myself. I started learning how to cook. My mom didn't know what the fuck al dente was, but the spaghetti was, like, mush. Legit. The macaroni, bro, one of the worst fucking foods you could ever have. Well, you mom, might as you well make? buy Chef Boyardee's. Oh, better. my God, bro. Allah, that was a staple. Mm -hmm. But you had the can or the macaroni. I'm going for the can every yeah. single time. And that's how in Lebanon, it's, it's this, they make macaroni in Lebanon, which is just, they'll put red, pay, you know, uh, uh, tomato paste, paste and water. That's it. And water and some, some salt and pepper. Uh, yeah, they'll yeah. chop up a fucking. Uh, a uh, 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 pepper, bro, that is this big. They'll chop them up into these giant ass pieces. They chuck them in. Chuck them in. They make pizza down there, bro. They put corn on the pizza. They put ketchup instead of fucking. That's disgusting. Sauce. It's the worst. But they love it. I don't know. They fucking. They like put it. corn and ketchup on a pizza. You That's know what? I'm staple, telling you. Bro. I'm telling you, man. We have to throw one of these pizza places there, bro. We'll be making hand over fist. They they have something similar, like. Indian motherfuckers, they're very resourceful. They keep opening these, like... Th there's one called Swan Pizza. They just put the most insane shit on They put, like, sweet and sour sauce on the pizza. It it's not bad, but it's like... That sounds disgusting. They go crazy. <laughs> sweet and sour sauce on a fucking They got pie, Osmos. Bro. I never see one Arab working at Osmos, bro. That's a fact. That's not real shawarma. If you come up to me and you tell me your favorite shawarma is Osmos, bro, I'm a peaceful guy, but I might spit on you. Well, that's I don't a know. fact. I might fucking... That's a fact. Yeah, but I don't know. Hey, there's That's also part of the beauty of living in North America, you know, the fusions and everybody gets together and, you know, I don't know. I was always curious on one thing. When you guys are doing your... When you're doing improv night, because I watched a lot of Andrew Shaw's at some point. And I think the guy's crowd control is retarded. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Probably shouldn't even say that word. You could I'm say it with a comic now, bro. Oh, all bets are off. You could say like, yeah, the white gloves are it. off. You know, we're no, no longer political. Fuck, yeah. But um, 
His crowd work is incredible. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever seen his crowd control. Oh, yeah. He has a whole episode called Crowd Control. Yeah. No, there's... So, yeah, there's different skills. And, and to us, it's not necessarily improv night. We haven't even had a show like this. My, fr my friend, again, George and I have been talking about doing just a crowd work show where every comic gets maybe a section of the audience and you can only do crowd work. You can't do jokes. Yeah. But it comes down to, for me, I prefer crowd work, but it's like going to the gym and you know these Arabs in particular, bro, they're only doing shoulders and bench press and fucking curls. That's it. They got legs like fucking toothpicks. <laughs> you have to work legs. You have to write jokes too, man. You can't just do crowd work, but... That's my preference, and it's like sometimes the crowd doesn't respond to jokes. They don't want jokes, and it's like that's my opportunity to work on my crowd work, and so I'll just go up and work on crowd work. Um, but How fast would you identify that? Like, what makes a what makes a top tier comedian top tier? Is it the ability to be able to just right away you can sense quickly that you know what fuck the jokes where you're just gonna go in on the crowd? Well, that, I, I'm I'm at five years and I'm learning that. So it's not really like a high level skill. It's almost like a basic thing where, you know, you've heard the term read the room. Yeah, yeah. It's part of that. It's like people are talking or interrupting jokes um, or they're yelling shit out at you. It's like, okay, the host, part of his job is to, you know, corral everybody in and get them in the mood for comedy. The, the, the host is not necessarily meant to go up there and destroy and when I say, a lot of these comic terms are so destructive, bombing and destroying. Uh, and grenades in the crowd. Grenades, but when you say destroy, it means like kill. It means like do very well. Um, that's not necessarily his job. His job is to suck the crowd in and get them ready for the show. So sometimes you'll have a host who isn't the best. Or sometimes it's not even the host's fault, bro. The crowd is just, you go to Cornwall or you go to arm prior whatever these motherfuckers are rowdy they've been drinking all day they're yelling there's nothing you could do so it's up to me to like work with that and and me personally i love it when people yell shit out at me because i'm lucky like my my brain is quick to process that but what makes a great comedian bro is a combination of all of it like there's some comedians that their specialty is writing jokes and there's so much that goes into that where it's like the subject matter because there are topics and things that are very we'll use the word hacky ha hackneyed or hack which is like stuff you hear all the time yeah um but sometimes you could take a topic like that and have a very unique opinion on it and make it funny um and keep a, f a flow going for 45 minutes yeah there's a whole thing about laughs per minute there's so many that go, so many things that go into a great comic, and and obviously, the best of the best. Every year or year and a half or two years, they have a whole new hour. Like over here in Canada, the standard for a headliner is 45 minutes. In the states, it's one hour, bro. Really? That's a whole other level. If you can do a new hour every year, year and a half, two years, and it's great, then you're you're somebody who is above the average, who is like stand out but if you've been doing the same set going town to town for five years six years you're doing the exact same jokes all the time then it's like you can still get those laughs you can still have great jokes but you're not necessarily a cut above because you've reached the point where you're comfortable and you know comfort bro that's killer it's the killer so somebody it's very scary to go out and do new material especially if you're doing an hour for me I got to do a new eight minutes. For me right now, that's scary. Really? Like, you know, yeah, because it's like, if you're a musician, you know, and, and I, I love music, bro, and, and a lot of times I wish I could do that. Um, and it's, I feel like it's vice versa. A lot of musicians wish they could do comedy. And it's, it's the whole thing of wanting something you don't have. But it's like a musician can go home, write a song, write it over and over, play the guitar, practice the song, do everything. And then you go out and 
you're still getting feedback, but you're not getting instant feedback. You can just put your head down and play the guitar, and that's it. You don't have to worry. But a comic, you're doing a new joke. My practice has to be in front of people. I can't practice in front of the mirror. Yeah. Maybe I can memorize the the parts that I want to talk about and whatever, but I don't know what the audience is going to think. I don't know what the beats are. I have to do that in front of people. So if I'm going out, I'm putting myself out there, bro. I'm doing new shit. I'm liable, very likely to bomb. You know, so you have to like accept that there's there might be a massive failure that comes with this. Fuck the amount of wave of emotions that a comic must go through is insane. That I yeah, yeah, it's hard, man. Yeah. And do you tailor it like as an even if you've memorized the joke word for word and you're still do you have to read the room and then you start to actually kind of custom tailor that joke while you're saying it, or do you just fucking read a line for line, and I, then do your act? For me, I'm working on on being more disciplined because I'm not a very on stage. I'm I just go off. I'm not very disciplined, and I have I have my jokes. But I don't practice them. It's just shit I've thought about and I work on them on stage. And so the one thing that I will, I'll, I'll never bend. I'll never be like, I have jokes that are more dirty and jokes that are of different uh, uh, content, I guess. And so I like to look at the comics before me, more specifically the host, usually, because I'm, I'm still... In, for the most part an opening act so i'm either going first or second in the show and so i'll look at what he's talking about and the response to the crowd and maybe i'll be like oh i can't do this joke tonight you know because really? they're, not, they're not reacting to like a sex joke or whatever they're shutting down so maybe i'll just talk about race instead or whatever uh so there's that but i'm i'm at a point where i'm like i'm me i'm gonna talk about what i talk about bro and if it's hopeless, then it's hopeless. And then maybe we'll switch the crowd work, maybe whatever. But And you're like, fuck it, let me just bomb real quick and then just move it on? Yeah, it's very rare that... Like, I still bomb, but it's rare that... I, that of course you still bomb, bro. You're Lebanese, bro. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Turn this shit fucking racial yeah, at this yeah. point. Every comic bombs, bro, you know. But it's like, when I'm bombing, it's because I suck. I suck that night. I'm missing the beats. I'm I'm stuttering. I'm doing whatever wrong. Most of the time, um, like I'll tell a joke that is like this, and if it bombs, then I know okay, I could switch gears to that to, to something else, and maybe that'll work. But the the nights where nothing works are very rare. Um, it's either I'm bombing because I'm I lost my confidence or um, because there's two people in the crowd or whatever it is, you know, but as do you, would you say comedy here is as popular as anywhere else, bro? It's sometimes, sometimes I feel like sad because we, and I'm not even talking about myself, bro. There's motherfuckers out there in this city that could be the best in the world. Like if everything goes right, because nothing in comedy, is not a straight path. Yeah. You can't just, you know, and, and I'm not disparaging any any other, like being a doctor or whatever, or a lawyer, like I can't even fathom doing that shit, the work that goes into that. But for that, bro, it's, I'm not saying it's easy, but it's simple where you learn your trade and then you learn about it in the books and then you go practice it. And if you're a good lawyer, bro, you'll most likely get hired. Sure. And there is a path to that. But in comedy, there's a lot that goes into it. There's a lot of moving parts. This guy that that owns this club doesn't like you for whatever reason. You made fun of his wife was in the crowd. You made fun of her. I don't know. There's so many different things that could go wrong. Politics. Yeah. There's a lot of politics involved. And so it's not as simple as just being funny. Unfortunately, I wish it was that simple. But Ottawa Comedy, bro, has some of the funniest motherfuckers in the country. Like, I'll see people that come in, and there's a lot of funny comics in Toronto, Montreal, and stuff. But they'll come in, and I'm like, they're not as good as, you know, Jeff Davis or Jake Davis. These are, I'm name-dropping Ottawa comics, but... It's okay. A motherfucker like Jeff Davis, who was a friend of mine, like, this guy grew up, he knows every cartoon, every com like, every comic, every he's just an encyclopedia of comedy. And he goes up on stage, bro, and it's like you never see anything funnier. 
And I don't see that in any other city, bro. You know? So we have a very good comedy scene, but there's no industry here. So a very good comics, no scene. Yeah. Th there, there's a scene, but there's no industry. Meaning there's no, like, recruits and j just for laughs would just shut down or whatever. But it's like you want to make connections. You want to grow in the industry. Typically, they say you have to leave the city. You have to go to Toronto or the States and sort of like start fresh there and get recognized there because that's where the belly of the beast is. Makes you know, sense. LA, New York, now uh, Austin, Texas, uh, Toronto. Even Montreal has a, a pretty strong industry. It's not crazy, but it's like a good stepping stone. But Ottawa is just dead. Uh, have you ever thought of leaving and going and starting in one of these places? Or do you feel like you kind of want to get your experience here and then move on? I do go back and forth on where to go, but I know that I have to go eventually. I, I, I want I want to be... There's different opinions and different high-level comics will give you different advice. Some will say go young. Some will say get good, then go. Because if I get 45 minutes in Ottawa and Canada, if I go to New York... I'm basically back to being an open micer, more or less, which is doing eight minutes in a bar in front of six people. It doesn't matter if you headline and do 45 minutes here. You got to go there and make a name for yourself. And so a lot of people find that difficult. That's where you have to sort of take the leap of faith. And so, yeah, I definitely want to do that eventually. But I know that I'm not, I, I want to at least get good enough to go down there and, and be great, you know? Because it's very sad, bro. Like, as an example, I had my boy here, uh, Shubs. He mm -hmm. makes music. And to be very honest, I like his music, man. You know, he has a lot of unreleased stuff that's coming out slowly. Yeah, I've seen clips. Of, yeah, yeah. I, heard, I listen to... He's, he is good. Yeah, man. bro, I'm telling you, you know, it's crazy. He has some other stuff that are coming out. Remember uh, Shiny Boy when he was showing that other shit? Let's be very honest, bro. They're fucking fire, man. And I'm like, bro... I'm like, if I didn't know you were, I didn't know you and I didn't know you were from Ottawa, I would have thought you were a States guy. Yeah. Because everything just correlates right back to being in the States. Yeah. And I'm like, the scene here just doesn't, they don't, it's like as if it's a capital, just because it's a capital city, it's as if they want to continue keeping that vibe. It's like a very governmental capital, capital place, you know? It is, yeah. And I even like myself, you know, there's a lot of great people out here. Like, we've had some invites on the pod, bro, and a lot of them are like, you know what? Honestly, I don't want to jeopardize my job. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And they got some great fucking stories, bro. Yeah. And I'm like, here we go back to this governmental bullshit, and, you know, they're always vetting what you're doing. Yeah. So, yeah, man, it's crazy. I just feel like, you know, I don't, I don't know if Ottawa's going to become any better. Like, me, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to have Ottawa talent on because I'm mm. from the city, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've had everything here, bro, from poverty to anything to mm. heartbreaks to love, whatever you want to name it. Beefs. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Fucking your love, bro. Tons of beefs. Of course. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's all I was, I was wondering about you guys because comedy is such a massive scene in the States, bro. Like mm. they go crazy for that shit. Yeah. Well, I've seen people go down there and just like, I, I, I like to... <laughs> I, I don't compare myself to anybody. I feel like that's a big mistake. But I do like to look at what went wrong for this person. They're very funny. They're great on stage. They went down to the States. They went down to Toronto. They whatever. And they came back with nothing, you know? Um, and it's like, again, there's no straight path to this thing. There's a lot of faith. There's a lot of... Well, you just said luck. it's like working out, bro. Yeah. So maybe they should have just stuck it out a little bit longer, kept doing the reps. That's what I think. I think um, you can give up completely and stop doing it, but you can also give up on yourself. You know, there's a lot of motherfuckers that have been doing the same set for five years, six years, seven years. And it's like when... And, and look, to be fair, there's a lot of people in the community... It's an outlet for them. They, they're everybody that does something has different intentions. Those motherfuckers that work on cars, they don't want to be mechanics. They just like working on their cars. Oh, that's a damn fuck. You know, so I, I don't, I don't talk down to anybody or whatever. Like I'll never, I'll make fun of people. That's what I do. But 
there's never a moral talk down to whatever you do, whatever you choose to do with comedy. But I really do believe that if you're passionate about it and you work hard and you're nice to people, you know, and you make the connect, you try to make connections and you try to put yourself on social media and you do all this stuff. If you keep, stay on the path unwavering, you can accomplish anything. Facts. So I, I think, but I, I mean, I look at from when I first started to where I am now, the gap that is there of improvement, I think that gap can translate from now to five years from now. I can have that same amount of gap if I keep doing what I'm doing, you know? It's about getting your repetitions. Yeah, and and if you put everything you have into it and, and you end up, you know, being a headliner in Canada and making, you know, whatever, 60000 a year, and that's where you're at, that's where I'll be at, bro, I'll be happy. For me, it's just about not giving up on myself and not settling. I'll give him my all, and if that's what my all is, bro, then it is what it is. I'll, I'll still keep doing this for the rest of my life, you know? Because you're doing that out of love, right? Yeah, exactly. Because honestly, sometimes I look at comics, I'm like, yo, you guys have, you have to have balls to be able to just jump on stage, especially like I was thinking about you at some point. I'm like, you know what? Let's be honest. Your biggest haters usually is your hometown. It's where you're from. Yeah. You know, so I'm like, you must have balls to be able to jump on stage and talk shit. You can be absolutely fucking drop down funny, but be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I know him from school or whatever. Until he actually gains popularity, like massive popularity, then they're going to be like, yeah, yeah, it's my boy. I knew him from school. Motherfucker, you weren't my, you weren't my boy, bro. That's with everything. Yeah. yeah, yeah, 100%. But as an example, that's all I was saying. Like, how do you feel now that you're from the city? Do you feel like you're getting love from the city? Or do you feel like as an example, because I'm from, <clears throat> because I'm from here, yeah, they don't want to see you succeed. Everyone wants to see people do good, yeah. not better than them. No, you know what, man? I've had people who went to school with me and shit reach out and come to shows. And, you know, at Yuck Yucks, we have a pretty regular audience. And they're always showing love. And, you know, there's, there's people that know you from open mics or whatever. Like, this scene, there's a lot of love, you know? But comics do get stuck being like, I don't want people to hate me. And then that's when you start wavering from who you are. And I think that's a big mistake. That's something that everybody has to shake off. That's something that I had to shake off where I'm like, I'm who I am, bro. I can't control how other people feel about me. I could control what I do. I could be righteous in everything I do. And if I'm con a consistent person and I do well on stage and, and I put my love into this, the people that are going to like me are going to love me. And the people that hate me, bro, it's unfortunate. I can't control it. But it's going to happen, you know? Nobody, if everybody loves you, bro, you're doing something wrong. That's dude. a fact. You know? So. Do you feel like you still go through that phase where you just start to lose confidence on stage still? Yeah, I mean, that's, for the past year, it's something, one of the biggest things that I've improved on is not wavering. Because like I said earlier, if you lose confidence on stage, bro, you're done. You're finished. finished. Yeah. Because they could sense that. P human beings, like, they're subconscious. Doesn't matter what level of intelligence you are, bro. You could tell when somebody's nervous. You could tell when somebody is stuttering, and you know, and then and, you're just bombing after that, yeah. bro. And if you lose Massive. confidence in yourself, they lose confidence in you, and it's over. Just carpet bombing the crowd. Eh? Yeah, but in in everything in life, you have to question yourself. You have to, if you're just 100 percent confident all the time, bro, that's bad. You're not doing. You're doing again. You're doing something wrong you have to question yourself and you have to be like where can i improve why did i why did this part of my set go wrong you know what's going on do you um, chop it up with the comics and be like yo what do you think there has to be comics there too no yeah yeah well, well you know i have my circle of friends that i'm closer with i'm pr i'm friendly with everybody and again like as with any uh profession any job like the new people you, they're gonna take some heat you're gonna make fun of them but it's it's out of love and the ones that like withstand it you sort of get this closer bond with them because they understand what's going on and i got made fun of bro for the first two three years sometimes i would go home and be like does, does this person like me like what the fuck bro i thought really? he liked me <laughs> but 
they do like you. They, they, they're, it's sort of, I don't like to use the word initiation, but it's lack of better term. And it's sort of like an initiation as part of it. The perfect term, bro. Yeah. Fits it. Yeah. Very well. And, and um, it's with every, if you go into construction, bro, you're the new construction guy. They're going to fucking make fun of you all day. Why are you, why are you holding the hammer like that? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? But if you take that advice, you learn. And you take it on the chin, you don't get sad, you don't get angry, you don't get resentful. It works out. And uh, to me, like, I've built a very close bond with a lot of these comics. Have you felt like, have they ever put you in a position where, like, yo, I'm done? I'm, I don't want to do this anymore? From all the shit talking? Even though you know it's jokes? Not, not from the shit talking, because like you said, we're, I, I was already used to it a lot. And I, and I got bull bullied a lot. Like, I wasn't... Comedy changed my life, bro. Like, I wasn't a very confident guy before this. You know, I got bullied a lot in high school. And, um, but, and, and, you know, growing up with Arabs and immigrants, you take a lot of heat. So I was already used to it to a certain extent. And I followed comedy. Like, I started really getting into comedy like two years before I did it, you know, with podcasts and stand up and all that. Before that, I, I was not really into it. But you hear other comics talk about them, their come up and, and that type of stuff and getting pranked and whatever the fuck, right? And getting heckled by other comics and all that. So I went through that and I knew it was part of it. I would get sad, but it never discouraged me. The one time that I sort of quit comedy was during COVID because I thought it was over. bro. I thought there wasn't going to be comedy anymore. And I'm like, you know what? I was going to work this government job the rest of my life, order Uber Eats, play fucking video games, get fat and just give up. <laughs> Fuck it, it's suicide by life, you know. Fucking I mean? yeah, and it's great. We had the war zone out, mm -hmm. you know, and we were playing war zone till like six in the morning. Yeah, and and there was again a lot of memes about this and a lot of, but it's true, man. It brought back that high school vibe where you would. I loved it. Yeah, I loved it too, bro. I had. I listen. I didn't say. I'm not saying I didn't have fun, but there was a lot of depression. I think a big bulk of depression comes from. I'm supposed to be doing something right now and I'm not doing it. Yeah. You know, there, there's days I'm like, you, you're a hard worker. I could tell. And you know, there's days where you're like, oh, I'm going to take the day off. I'm just going to sit home and play video games all day. And how do you feel at the end of the day, bro? You feel like shit. 100%. So it's like, I wasn't doing what I was meant to be doing. And that's where a lot of it came from. But if I feel like I'm putting everything I have into my day, I never feel depressed you know did it change your mentality when they finally started opening the clubs back up for you to do comedy did it feel like i had to kind of break myself back in oh man i i felt it was hard man they opened it up and i think a month and a half later i i started doing comedy it was hard to get your foot back in the door because it was you're not starting from scratch because you have all this knowledge but you're rusty bro it's like it will go back to the gym you go to the gym every day you build up muscle and strength and whatever you stop going for like six months you still have more muscle than you did before you started going to the gym yeah and maybe if you start going back that muscle will come back quickly but you're still flabby you're still tired when you get on the treadmill you're still you're like you shit. can't lift you're you're starting out with 20s you know a curling or whatever it's like you that part is hard bro because you're like holding on to what you had like i used to curl 60s bro now I'm curling 20s? Fuck, you're speaking fast. What the fuck is this? I was just saying that the other day. I used to fucking warm up with 80s on shoulder press, bro. I mm -hmm. had to change gyms because the 120 was too low. I needed 150. I can't even fucking push 50 pounds now. Exactly. You have to get past that ego. Um, And then I did it. I slowly started getting back into it. And then the love came back. And from there, it's I don't miss a day. Like... I, you can't do comedy every day because there's not enough shows. But I'll be at shows most days. And I'll message people, yo, if there's any dropouts, let me know and whatever. And I'm constantly thinking about it. Constantly. If something embarrassing happens to me, bro, I'm like, I'm going to... Or I'm sad or whatever. It's like, I'm going to bring this to the stage and see what happens. You know, you know, just chop it up and talk about it. Yeah. Have you ever watched Joey Diaz's shit? Yeah, yeah. He's you know, one of my favorites. Yeah. You know what? I... Th I was, it was funny because when I was watching Joey Diaz, like even just his Joe Rogan interviews and his podcasting and whatever, he has great stories. And then it started to get me thinking, you know, 
Do a lot of you guys actually give out real stories in your uh, when your skits? Yeah, yeah. I I know most of the comics that I know will right, but there's some comics that don't, and there's new comics that feel like they have to be larger than life or whatever. And but a lot of times you could tell. A lot of times you could tell. I, I'll never forget this. I was. I'm not going to name the comic, but I was at this comic. He was taping uh, an album, and it wasn't going well. And he was telling the story, and you could tell that the story was, like, there's really imaginative and, and out there. Like, if you go all the way, then you make it work. And there, there's only certain comics that could do that. But if it's, like, a half fake story, where it's, like, it could be true, but you know that it's not, and I remember somebody in the front row, like, I was just in the crowd, and somebody in the front row whispering to their friend, they're like, that's not a real story, you know? That's, that's the worst. And I was like, I never, I never want that. You know, I, I've never even tried telling a fake story, but I know most of the time when somebody goes on, on stage and tells a new joke and it's like something that happened to them, I'll talk to them after the show and be like, yo, like that actually happened. They're like, yeah, da, da, da. and then they'll tell me the whole oh, the real story thing. Yeah, so yeah, a lot of times it's it's real, bro. You know, that sucks, bro. If someone yeah. the crowd's starting to be like, yo, this guy's full of shit. That's mm. brutal. Well, one of the things I found interesting about the whole Joey Diaz thing is, other than him just telling you legit stories, I honestly found his conversations better than a stand-up. But yeah, a lot of times what he was he basically always hangs out at the comedy uh, at the comedy club. Yeah, is that you do that? Yeah, I mean, the 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 club hangout was a lot better in the past before COVID. Um, you know, we had the yuck yucks on Elgin, and after every show, you go outside and smoke, you know, pass joints around and talk and bullshit, and and then you would go to a bar after and do the same. Like hanging out with comics is the funnest. It's so fun, bro, because. These are the funniest motherfuckers in the city. So imagine you hanging out with your friends and you're bullshitting and you're laughing and you're telling stories. It's that, but with comics. Um, and, well, and they got professionalism in the... It, the zero, but it's no... Prof it's zero. It's just these are funny people and we're bullshitting. We're worse than we are on stage. We're say, talk, saying shit you can't say on stage maybe, you know? Well, you'd get, if that conversation was released, yeah. you guys would be fucking yeah. toast. Exactly. And sometimes... It's funny, I'll see, like, audience members or friends of comics, like, in the circle, and we'll be talking about shit, and I'll just, like, peer over and look at their face, bro, and they're like, what the fuck is this, you know? <laughs> uh, but that still happens uh, nightly with the open mics. The open mics, there's a lot of camaraderie <clears throat> there after so the show. COVID really fucking changed the game after, eh? I, I still it, feel remnants of COVID now with I see people. There is. Um, mostly it's, like, a lot of... The main shows shutting down um, and reopening. Like, the New Yuck Yucks is in Lincoln Fields, bro. You're not going to drive up to Lincoln Fields just to hang. When it was at Elgin, you can walk. To, like, a lot of comics live downtown or are downtown because of whatever. Yeah. And it's like, you could just hang out there, hang out outside, and then go to a bar afterwards. Or at an open mics are usually at bars. So you do the show, you go outside, you smoke some joints, you go back in, you drink, you talk. And then you go out, smoke again, and it's like a whole, a whole thing, bro. It's it's um, it's definitely my favorite part. And sometimes I'll tell a story, like I make fun of other comics. If I see a comic try jokes, like sometimes someone will slip in a joke, but not say it's a joke, but they're like working on the joke. Yeah, I'll be like, motherfucker, are you trying bits on me right now? Like, what the fuck is this, bro? We're just talking. <laughs> but sometimes a story will slip out, and I'll be like. Oh, I could talk about this on stage, you know? And then I'll try it out the next night or whatever. It's, bro, wallah, it's crazy what COVID did to people. And Jad, I'll be very honest out of my own experience. Yeah. I didn't follow any of the fucking rules. Bro. I don't give a fuck. I'm ignorant, bro. Ah, uh, wallah, me too, man. I'm going to live my life on my own terms. Yeah. But the crazy part was is some of these guys, some of the coolest guys, you know, they basically got choked down, a lot of them with their jobs and all the other yeah. shit. And then the social aspect was murdered. 
Mm-hmm. I'd be having conversations with guys that you've known forever. And it's like every time you're chilling, you're having a blast. And then sometimes you're like, you know, they just go silent or they jump on their phone. I'm like, what happened to you, man? We used to have great conversations and you used to fucking have yeah. some good nights. And bro, and he's like, honestly, a lot of the final would admit and be like, yo, being locked in your house all day, it's literally like jail. Yeah. And then you come out of, uh, most people come out of jail different. Let's be yeah. very honest, you know? Yeah. So it, most of the population came out completely fucking reformed into some weird way. Yeah. And it's both sides, right? You're either like super high hygiene, whatever, or you're super like anti-government now. It's crazy. Like there's two, yes. there's the two types. Um, I, I, I'm anti-pharmaceutical at this point, bro. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I like to say... I mean, I'm I'm a better person, but I'm the same mentality as I was. I'll never let something like that influence. Maybe during COVID, I, I had a little bit of resentment, and I'd be like, "Yo, fuck, you know, fuck this or fuck that." But I came out with the same mentality. And other than maybe a few comics that you don't see anymore, bro, that were so funny, man. There's a couple comics that I have right now in my head. They were so fucking good. And COVID came around, and then they just stopped going out. I believe it, bro. Um, but for the most part, everything is back to normal. Like, maybe in the beginning, people weren't passing out joints or going out as much or staying out. But as far as the comedy scene, people are, it's back to, to normal for the most part. Some audience members, you know, these are human beings. Like, there's thousands and thousands of them. They're not all going to be the, the same. Some people were affected by it. And there are comics now that are leaning into the post-COVID thing. Whether it's the, you know, pol- political correctness or whether it's the anti-government. And they're drawing fans that are also on their side. Makes sense. Because so they've created such a nice divide. Yeah, and, and it's... Or I should say massive divide instead of nice yeah, divide. Yeah, and... and, and you know, whether everybody is righteous about it or whether the comic is righteous about it or they're just doing it because it's another avenue to get views and whatever. I don't know, but it, it works. But other than that, I think it's back to the way it was. I think when people say it'll never be the same, it's a lot of nostalgia. And that club on Elgin, like, I came up there. I've had some of the best moments in comedy there. I'll always miss that club. I was gonna say you must miss that club. I love, I love it. Um, and you know, you go there now and it's an escape room and shit. And I'm like, yo, what the fuck? But come on, man, fuck fitness. We gotta work out the laughs. Yeah, but it's um, it's back. It's back. You can get if you see a guy with a mask in the crowd, tell me you're gonna chop him up. He I'll... must be asking for it. You show up to a comedy club, yeah, wearing a mask. Uh, I mean. It depends what they look like. If it's like an old man with a mask, I'm like, fair enough. Let this fucking guy do his thing. <laughs> but sometimes they'll have a weird looking mask or something. And I'll make fun of them. Not in a COVID way. Not in a you're scared way. In a you look funny type of way. You look ridiculous or whatever it is. Um, you know, my, uh, my again, my friend George has a, he has a joke that he does. I'm not going to say the joke, but it's based on a review that he got. Uh, absolute comedy. And the review was like, this man threatened to kill us and then said he would spit in our mouths, like he would take our mask and spit in our mouths. Holy mouth. fuck. No, he goes hard. George goes hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This is out of context. If you see him, he's the funniest motherfucker. But um, a lot of comics will do it in their own way. But I'll never try to force anything. If I could think of something funny, I'll say it. If not, just leave it alone. But why do they, you know what's crazy? Why do you hold comedians to the same standard? you would hold a politician like bro they're fucking comics man they're here to talk shit yeah it's maniac and go home you know they have a good time they want you to have a good time why the fuck are you taking them in a but bro they're not politicians man why are you holding them to the same all cancel this whole cancel culture fuck me man yeah yeah i mean you you could i think if you have a a fan base and you're righteous with what you say you're not nervous you're not saying things just to say them you can get away with it. There's um, a great comic, uh, Shane Gillis. Uh, I don't know I don't if you know. heard of him. So he he got he got a gig on Saturday Night Live a few years ago, and got immediately taken off because of something he said on a podcast. Really? Yeah. 
And at the time, it was like, obviously, probably very difficult for him. But he had a fan base, and he's very funny, and he just kept doing what he was doing. And eventually, a couple weeks ago, bro, he was he's doing so well now, they brought him back as a guest on Saturday Night Live. Bro. Really? Yeah. So it's like, I think if you're just righteous in everything you do and you're funny, you can't really truly get canceled. That's your new catch name. Your your Lemo your Lebo Dom is the righteous, bro. Uh, you know that's it. Lebo Dom is the righteous. I, I think if in your heart you don't do anything like you tell yourself I did nothing wrong, really. I was just trying to be funny, or I was just doing this, or I was doing that. You can't really. Nobody could really stop you if you're going out of your way and being an edge lord and saying things just to be edgy, and then you get canceled. It's like you don't really have a leg to stand on, you know? Because you weren't Lebo Dom as the Righteous. Yeah, I, I've I've made, like, uh, there was a woman that started crying at my show. Oh, yeah? Because of something. She called me racist, and she started crying. And I just explained to her, I'm not racist. I'm just talking about, the, like, this. it is what it is, you know? And the crowd was on my side. She was crying. She's a woman that is crying. But because they, I believed what I said, and they believed what I said... They were like, oh, she's in the wrong. But if I let her win, or if I didn't believe in myself and I let her win, then everybody would have turned on me. You know, because it's like, oh, this guy, maybe he is racist. Like, there's a doubt now. Maybe he is this. Maybe he is that. That's a bad position to be in. Yeah. So Does she, Do they just run away after that, or do they actually stay for the whole set? I don't remember. She went to the washroom and... Never came back. I, again, I was an opening act, so I was a small part of the show. Um, maybe I was doing like 10, 15 minutes. So it happened when I got off stage, she went to the bathroom and started crying or whatever. And I think she came back and watched the rest of the show, but there's some audience members, bro. They're just, they're just there to like, they're curmudgeons. They don't even want anything to do with this shit. They're, they're they have their own politics. They get offended and Tell them to go the fuck home. Stay home then, man. It's don't so show easy. Up. It's so easy. You don't like it. I, if I don't like a movie. Bro, I'm not going to sit down and watch the whole rest of the fucking... I'm going to walk out of the theater. That's it. I'm not going to sit down and complain about the movie for the next hour and a half. You got a fucking life. It's very simple. So, I don't know. There, there are these people out there, but you can't let them control what you do. You know? So, what's your message to these upcoming comics? I'm an upcoming comic, bro. But if I'm talking about the people doing it one year, two year, the one thing I always say is, like, you're going to suck, bro. Don't expect to be great off the bat. There are people that are exceptions to the rule. And the exceptions to the rule, bro, they're four or five years in, and they got famous. You know, that's still a long time. Um, but it's like, the one thing I always say to somebody is like, it's like going to the gym. It's like swimming. It's like anything. You're going to be skinny at first. You're going to not know what you're doing. You might get injured. You might do whatever the fuck. But eventually, over time, you pick it up and you learn the ropes a little bit and it's like the first year two years you're gonna suck and then at three you start to you know uh you know the movie space odyssey when the the song starts playing and the the, the monkeys gain consciousness and that's the beginning of man or whatever eventually you're gonna have that moment you're gonna be like oh shit this is what i have to do and that's that's when it begins that's when it really begins that's the journey that's where the journey begins and now you're like okay now you're starting to learn and pick things up from other comics and you know so just don't more, give up i got one like, more question for you g yeah, yeah when you said that comedy changed your life because you weren't a confident guy before because you said you were getting bullied how yeah. did it change your life in a sense of how did you even have the balls if you were getting bullied and you're already were you a shook guy back in the days were you were you just kind of like just intimidated kind of thing yeah i always had I always had like an underlying philosophy, but I was, to put it brief, bro, I was like scared of the world. And I thought everybody was better than me, you know? Um, but from listening to these comics like Joey Diaz, like, you know, whoever, these podcasts, they talk about their journey and they talk about how difficult it was in the beginning. I knew that I... When I did my first set, I knew that I was at home. And I knew that I just had to, like, 
you know when you jump into a, a, a cold pool or whatever, you yeah. just you just jump, you close your eyes and you just jump in. I'm like, I'm gonna close my eyes, I'm gonna fucking do this shit, and eventually, I'm not gonna be nervous anymore. Um, and it was like getting better at comedy gave me a, a purpose in life, and with that purpose, I applied it to everything. Where I'm like, oh, if I can get better at this, I can get better at communicating with people i could get better at looking people in the eye i could get better at not you know looking down when i'm talking to somebody and, and mumbling my voice and whatever it's like i just took the idea of you can be good at anything if you put your mind to it and i applied it to my personality to you know whatever it was so it's like the lessons learned through comedy i just applied them to life and that's you know what? I wanna I wanna end that on that note because I think that's a beautiful message, bro. I feel most people develop like when I speak to a lot of different people, a lot of them develop their their uh, confidence when they find purpose. Yeah, and I think that's a very big thing. Yeah, Caesar, man, bro, it's beautiful. I, I man. love you, man. I love you too, bro. I, you're you're my brother. Uh, I like coming on here and. I could be myself, you know. It's nice. I yeah. love it, man. I want, yeah. I want, bro. Come back. I want to chop it up more with of you. Of course, we're yeah, running yeah. out of time, Habibi. Listen, I want to see. I want to come by to one of your skits. Yeah, I um, want all you people that are watching come see. Come see my boy Cesar McCool. Let me know? let me do. Can, my, can I yeah. plug a show? <laughs> April twenty seventh, Yuck Yucks. Uh, my friend Chris Paul and I are doing a show. Um, it's going to be an, a variety show very the funniest comics in the city and when i say that i'm not self-promoting like these are funny motherfuckers april 27 you get your tickets online and um my podcast lebanese weight watchers with my friend george that's it check it out i want to jump on the pod come see us april we're gonna come to the show you'll be able to come kick it with us at that time we'll have of a course. very good time thank you thanks for having me man. caesar all love brother all love always. all right baby yeah Sorry,